Hi, I'm Matt here in Michigan. And I'm Randall here in Texas. Today, Matt and I are diving back into the world of Quentin Tarantino to bring you the follow-up Kill Bill Volume 2 from 2004. It stars, once again, Uma Thurman, who also co-wrote the script, Daryl Hannah, Michael Madsen, Gordon Liu, and David Carradine as Bill. Directed and co-written by Quentin Tarantino, who Matt already mentioned is well known for many films, so I'm going to give you three different films this time around. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Jackie Brown, and Inglorious Bastards. But before we get too far into this flashback review, make sure if you like it, give it a like. Likes are really helpful. If you want to see more, subscribe to the channel and ring the bell icon if you always want to know when we're uploading new videos. Now in Kill Bill Volume 2, the bride continues her quest for revenge against the three remaining assassins who killed her fiancé and friends during her wedding dress rehearsal and in the process prevented her from raising her young daughter. It had a $30 million budget and earned more than $152 million at the box office. It received similar scores as its predecessor from critics, but higher scores from audiences. I remember watching this when it first came out and, and thinking to myself, oh yeah, you know, I really like Kill Bill Volume 1, so I'm really going to like Kill Bill Volume 2. And I still like Kill Bill Volume 2. So that, like, that hasn't changed or anything. But I am still shocked, as I was then, by just how different Kill Bill Volume 2 is from Kill Bill Volume 1. Volume 1 has a lot of action and, and jokes and over-the-top gore and everything, and Volume 2 does not have a ton of that in it. And chiefly, the biggest thing about it, and I mentioned this in our Volume 1 flashback review, was, was how much I liked the Tarantino feel of putting things out of order, not necessarily filming it all chronologically, but... For the most part, you know, one one like flashback scene exception, this is a very normal film. It's chronological. It just happens. So when you watch them, uh, you know, back to back, it's a very stark contrast. I still like Kill Bill Volume 2. I think it does a good job completing the story that we started in Volume 1. And I agree with Randall. It is a bit of a different movie, even kind of tonally different too. I think this one more focusing on kind of like telling about our stories, especially about our two main characters, I would say, the bride and Bill. So a lot more of that. But, you know, we still get some action scenes in this movie, even if they're not as, as big or grand as we saw in the first film. Everyone wanted to see Bill and, <laughs> and you know, the bride go at it, Hattori Hanzo's sword style, but, you know... The film works out the way it, you know, works out. <laughs> I suppose the idea is we cross Hanzo swords. Am I right? So, as I was saying in the retrospect, we do, I think, get more story or character building in this movie. Like I mentioned, especially with our two main characters. They were kind of mysterious a bit in Volume 1. Heck, we didn't know the bride's name in Volume 1, and now... We actually know Beatrix Kiddo. Marty Catroser? Here. Melanie Harhouse? Here. Beatrix Kiddo? Here. Same thing with Bill. We see Bill's face early on in this film, and we didn't see it at all in Volume 1. And we learn a bit more about Bill's character, too. So, yeah, it was kind of interesting. And, you know, this story does more like, you know, building up to that big showdown that has been hinted to at the very beginning of the first movie. And in this movie, the bride is going to kill Bill. And when I arrive at my destination, I am going to kill Bill. For me, the story element that is the most interesting is the cliffhanger from Volume 1. Like, right where Volume 1 ends, and Bill says, One more thing, Sophie. Is she aware her daughter is still alive? Like, then it just goes, you know, cut. That's the end of Volume 1. And in Volume 2, 
that becomes a pretty big thing, obviously, for the climax of this film. So the way the story unfolds in this, where she's, you know, still trying to seek revenge, she's killed Bud, she's killed, you know, um, whatever, Mountain Snake Woman, can't remember her name, it's not important. <laughs> and then she's driving up to Bill's, and she's she's ready to go, and then completely disarmed. For me, that story element was unknown to our main character, but known to the audience. I love that. I love when the audience is in on that kind of drama and then a character gets surprised by it. But that leads me kind of slightly into characters a little bit because, you know, this film actually kind of has fewer characters, even though the same amount of of like people be needing some killing in this one. Um, actually more. I mean, she only really hit you know, two of her, her list in the first movie. I like the characters. I like how you find out that Bud and Bill are brothers and that they're kind of dis, you know, having a rough go of things. Like, you know, things didn't go so well. What worked for me is these backstories starting to come to fruition for the bride, Beatrix, and, and for Bill. And after, after everything that happened with her, after, all of this, it's like the gang completely broke up, you know? Well, with without her, she's like the linchpin assassin of this group or something like that. But, you know, they don't explore that. They're just sitting here exploring these characters. They're just diving into these characters. And that was enjoyable. I definitely like the character development in this movie. I think this movie does have more character development stuff. We learn more about characters. Mentioned in our last review, we learned a bit about Oren. But this one, I think, you know, a lot of our characters in this one are built up. You know, of course, like I was already saying, Bill and the Bride and stuff. But as you were talking about, too, like Bud. I actually really like Bud in this movie. Not necessarily I like Bud if he was like a real person or anything. But I do like the character development of Bud. We learn a lot about Bud's character, not from just being told about Bud, but seeing how other characters interacting with Bud. See Bud's body language and stuff in this movie. Seeing what kind of condition Bud lives in and what Bud prioritizes. I think there's good storytelling in that character, building that character as one of those. And yeah, you know... Seeing how other characters respond to Bud and talk about him when we talk about, like, Elle. You know, when she reveals her how she truly feels about Bud and stuff. Of a bushwhacking, scrub, elky piece of <laughs> like you. And, you know, Bill, we even get a scene where Bill is talking to Bud and stuff, too. And we have Bud with his employer at the titty bar, which, man, I remember that scene quite a bit. That's one of the more memorable scenes. For me, is when he's in that office and gr getting grilled by his boss. What are you trying to convince me of exactly? That you're as useless as a right here? Well, guess what, buddy? I think you just convinced me. That is good. I think this has a really good job or better job, I think, than volume one of actually building up our characters. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that we spend so much time on his character, which... It's kind of like an, yes, inconsequential, but still very important character to Bill. You learn a ton about Bill and, and other people through Bud, and you learn a ton about Bud just by the way he acts, which is great filmmaking. But the thing I really like about Bud's character is that, you know, he doesn't want to die. He doesn't want to be killed by anybody exactly, you know, but the bride or anyone else. But he is fully able to admit, you know, we did terrible things to her and she deserves her revenge. That doesn't mean he's going to lay down and take it, though. So I guess we'll just see. Okay. So, like, that's a great character building moment. And you learn that, like I said a little bit ago, like, you know, him and his brother aren't doing so well. And maybe he doesn't really get along at all with Elle's character, like... It's fine. You learn a ton about other people through his character. So, 
as Randall and I mentioned in volume one, you know, Kill Bill takes a lot from a lot of different genres, but actually I think this one takes from less. I don't think we get as much of like the grindhouse or the black exploitation or whatever in this. Yes, it still does have the Western and the samurai bit, but I think this one more instead of the samurai, I think we get a bit of like Kung Fu, you know, in this movie and stuff instead. One of the things that I want to focus on, too, that we we're kind of talking about the first one is the action. And I think the action in this movie is quite a bit different. We we're talking about, like, the, you know, the big over-the-top gore and everything action scene as we're going to fight between, you know, the bride and, like, Lucy Liu's character. This movie, I think, takes a much different approach. Our fights and stuff are pretty, you know, short and stuff or happen in kind of, like, a different way maybe with like the exception of the l you know beatrix fight which is a bit longer i guess but it's not this over the top you know grand scene setting where our bride has to cut through a whole bunch of different ones i think it's a different type of storytelling that we have with the action in this one so that's why i want to specifically talk about the action as the genres of this film yeah, this film is much more serious. It's almost much more a drama than than anything else. Like, yes, the samurai and the sword play is still there. The spaghetti western kind of feel is still there. But mostly, now we're concentrating on the characters. So we've almost become a dramatic movie instead of just that over-the-topness of the original. But, you know, like if you had put these films together specifically like this and done a four-hour movie... That might have been, I don't necessarily four hours is too long because there are other four hour films, but that would have been maybe alleged too far. But because they're split into two movies, because volume two is just this very serious way, I think it works. I think it works as its own film. If you had actually put them together, then this might not have worked as well. Do, 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 do. What I didn't see coming, especially when I originally watched this film uh, you know i was kind of thinking oh it's going to be like kill the volume one and then it wasn't and then all of a sudden for like a small amount of time it was and that's with the pi may stuff all of the the like flashback to the pi may and the suffering that she goes through and you think well that's that's neat and it's fun and that like gets her out of this situation that she's in where bud has buried her alive um like okay that that was an interesting like long detour to get us back to the storyline that we need to tell but other important things happen in that time it wasn't just hey she's gonna break out of her coffin using this like trick and stuff that she learned from pai mei no 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 other important things that happen slightly after this with l and then bill also are told during that pai mei scene so that was a pleasant surprise when i watched this film for me what i guess i didn't really see coming is how much different characters underestimate each other in this film. I think with Kill Bill Volume 1, it's really like, you know, who is, like, the better fighter? It's really, like, building up, you know, the bride as, like, you know, the bride's just better, especially when she's fighting, like, Gogo. You know, the bride's just better. Fighting Oren, she just bested him. And this one, anytime anyone, like, loses a fight or dies, it's because they underestimated their opponent. Like when B first runs into Bud's camper or whatever you want to say, she gets shot with a shotgun, not expecting him to be waiting with a gun. She underestimated her opponent. I mean, even Bud, when he died to the snake that L put into the bag, he underestimated his relationship with L. I mean, even the big finale scene, Bill, Bill dies because he underestimated that Pai Mei actually taught uh, Beatrix the exploding palm you know heart technique kind of thing in this hey even talking about pai mei pai mei dies because he underestimated l and didn't think that l would actually you know poison him you know with fish head stuff so me i think that was kind of the the unexpected and I'm, I'm saying this is a negative no not a negative i'm just not expecting the you know the different type of storytelling from you know kill bill volume one to like volume two and it's something that i didn't really notice you know when watching it previous that i kind of caught this time I think it's interesting that you should say that. I have a a, a follow up on your un like underestimating people. I, I never got the impression. I I mean I know it's kind of maybe there that Bud has to live in the squalor that he does. I think he 
gives off the impression of living in squalor. He's Bill's brother who lives in a villa, you know? He has a, like, one-of-a-kind, you know, Hanzo Hattori sword. He was a famous, or not necessarily famous, but, you know, an assassin. He was making bank, okay? And I, I think that he doesn't need to live the way he does. He chooses to. And that goes right along with what you're saying, the underestimation. Because I love that of all the people that the bride has to fight, but is the only one who almost gets the comeuppance on her, you know, like the not comeuppance, the but is the only one who actually almost succeeds in taking her out. I just think that like volume two is a bit more cerebral. Like volume one is just like, hey, we're just kind of like see who's like investor. Or, but yeah, I agree. Like, Bud, I think part of it, I wouldn't say that, you know, it's an act, but I think. It also is Bud kind of making himself look a little bit more vulnerable than he actually is. I think a lot of our characters do that. I, you know, I think L kind of does that, you know, with Bud being all friendly with Bud and stuff. And, you know, really thinking like, yeah, I'm going to pay you a million dollars for the sword. Heck no, I'm going to take that money. You're getting nothing. I don't really care about you. You know, so I really do think that this movie is more cerebral than than the first one, especially when it comes with our interaction between characters. All right, I like Kill Bill Volume 2. I think it is a good conclusion to our story. It is a different movie than Volume 1, different feel, and I think it takes a different approach, which is kind of interesting that this was initially supposed to be one movie. And that's how I recommend that you view these two. I recommend that you view Volume 1 and then watch volume two. So I I I actually like it, it it's a hard thing. I like volume two a lot. Um but they're such different movies, it's hard to say like, hey, I like one over two or two over one. I just like them both for their own qualities. You know, I don't I don't necessarily think that you have to watch them back to back, but that they are both particularly good to watch back to back. Volume one might be the fun crazy go-to film of the of the them if you're like looking for a a funny weird quirky action film yeah sure go watch volume one and volume two this is the one where you get the the seriousness the characters the all the the character uh growth i guess you could say that's all here in in this one and i like them both i like this one in particular for for all of the character stuff everyone out there knows i'm a sucker for characters but of course, we want to know what you guys think all about Kill Bill Volume 2. Put that down below in the comments if you want to, please. If you go visit our YouTube page, we also have other flashback movie reviews, new movie reviews, some TV show reviews, and some deeper dive discussions. We also have a Facebook page. Be sure to check us out there. We put a lot of different posts on there. Some from our fandom, some with some other stuff. We also post a day before our reviews come out to let you know the topic of that review. If you don't have a Facebook page or don't want to check us out on Facebook, don't worry about it. Just put us on your calendar. We have new videos that come out every Monday and Thursday. For now, I'm Matt here in Michigan. Have a good day. And I'm Randall here in Texas. See everyone next time. Next time on No Market Media. Please consider checking out some of our other videos.